I'm I have three minutes, so yeah. I'm not ready. Yeah, I'm not ready. Okay. So, are you going to stop my stream? Or are you going to stream? Okay. However you want. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you out tonight. It's a miserable night, but you came anyhow. I commend you for that. God is good. Can you say amen? Are you, have you come to worship tonight? Have you come to hear the word tonight? I'm ready. Are you? How many believe the Spirit of God's ready? All right. He's already here, but we want him to come upon us. because In the New Testament, he comes upon a congregation. It's going to come upon us individually and corporately as we allow that to happen. Can you say amen? amen. All right. Would you stand, please? Together now. Holy Spirit, you're already here. Come now upon us with your anointing. The anointing to worship. We welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. We praise you. We magnify you. We love you. We adore you. You're so precious and so wonderful. Hallelujah. Glory be to your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We magnify you. We love you tonight in Jesus' name. <coughs> Praise him. Hallelujah. All right. I know Pastor Johnny and Stephanie are ready to go. We're going to join them.
royalty Who could care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus
sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. That's why I trust Him. That's why I'm trusting God. He's the one. that the song says I trust in God right it doesn't say I trust in man because man will fail us time and time again I'll probably fail all of you because I'm a man and I am I'm not the one that we can put our our faith and our trust in because he will never fail me no he will never fail trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail, I trust in God. Praise the Lord. God's so good. Can you say amen? We got some prayer requests we want to bring before the Lord tonight. I'm going to ask Margie if she would come up where she, she's over here. She's already been praying. She's already warmed up in the area of prayer. She's ready to go. We need to pray for Patty while she's gone. To be with her friend in Texas who has a lot of health concerns. And already there's been miracles in her life. And so we'll pray for Patty. And we need to pray for Pastor Rich because he's a bachelor for, for <laughs> Need to lift him up in prayer. Nathan really needs our prayers. He's coughing still. And... Uh, so lift him up in prayer tonight, and Deb, his daughter, is not feeling up to par either. I'd like you to pray for Rachel. She has a health concern. If you'd lift her up in prayer, I would really appreciate it. I would like us to continue to pray for our country. A lot's going on. Even today, a lot's been going on. 
Let's believe God for his intervention. Let's believe God to help this nation to return to where it should be. Can you say amen? amen. Pray for Israel. Pray for that part of the world. There's a lot going on there, too. And we need the intervention of God to keep things where they should be so they don't get out of control. We need to pray for wisdom for the Pentagon and for whichever generals over that area right now or generals that they will certainly have wisdom on what to do. Let's believe God for them. Can you say amen? amen. Will you stand as we lift these needs before the Lord? One more thing, it's good to have Kevin back from Uganda safely. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. Um, Father God, we're just coming to your presence, Father God, and I just want to ask you for those that need healing, Lord. Rachel, I ask you for Rachel, Father God. I ask you for Nathan, for his daughter, Lord Jesus. Father God, I ask you for Patty's friend, my Lord. Father God, I ask you for Patty, Lord, that you give her the strength that she needs to help her friend, my Lord Jesus. Because this is what you require from us, my Lord Jesus, to help one another, Lord. Bless her, give her the strength, and help her friend, Lord Jesus. Put your healing hand in her body, Lord. Complete healing in Jesus' name, my Lord. Father God, I ask you, Father God, for this nation, Father God. Your word says, one nation under God. One nation under God. My Lord Jesus, this is under you, my Lord. Father God, you take control, Father God, because you have control of everything, my Lord Jesus. Father God, I just thank you because you always listen to our prayers, my Lord Jesus. Father God, I ask you um, for anyone else that I forgot, my Lord Jesus. Forgive me if I forgot, Lord, but anyone that is sick, anyone that is sick, Anyone that is sick, Lord, you put your healing hand in their bodies, Lord Jesus. Because your word says, by your stripes we are healed, my Lord. You took all of our diseases, my Lord Jesus, and we deposit our faith in you, my Lord. Father God, you take control, Father God. Father God, I ask you for Israel, my Lord Jesus. The apple of your eye. The apple of your eye, Lord Jesus. Pour out your spirit over there, Lord Jesus. Bring peace, Father God. Bring peace, Father God. Bring peace, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God. Oh, Father God, send your angels of protection, Father God. And I ask you, Father God, for the other side. You know the other side, Lord. I ask you to have mercy, Lord. Because you are a merciful God, Lord. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. And touch their hearts, Lord. Father God, cease. Cease everything, Lord. Cease everything, Lord. Cease everything, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, and I thank you for this day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Marge. Testimonies, do we have any tonight? Margie's got one. She hasn't even sat down yet, but she's got a testimony. No, I just want to thank God because today's my anniversary. And I, I'm 33 years married to my beautiful husband. <laughs> and I, I thank God for the husband that the Lord has given me. He takes care of me. He, um, he's always there for me. Um, he's a hardworking man. He's not a lazy man. He's a very hardworking man. And I admire that in him. And he's always there for me. Whatever I need, he supplies it. And I love that. I love my husband dearly. The Lord gave him to me, and he's mine. <laughs> he's mine. <laughs> and I'm his, and I just thank God for him. He's, he's wonderful to me. That's it. And I thank God for these 33 years. That's it. Amen. Praise God. Someone else with a testimony? Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to testify for all of you. I thank God for you. Thank God for your faithfulness coming out on Wednesday nights. Even as I said early on, a miserable Wednesday night like we're having tonight. 
it may not be miserable to all of you, but it certainly it was coming down like cats and dogs earlier. And the wind was blowing, it was in sheets of water across the parking lot. But you came, and so you guys are the best congregation in all the world. I know we don't have everybody out here on the Wednesday night, but you're a sample of what we really have. Can you say amen? amen. And I saw Kevin raise his hand. There's 113 people that wished me a happy birthday. And it's not about my birthday. They saw what we did in Africa. I have over 500 people on my page, and they don't always move and talk. But God was with us 9,000 miles is how far we went. And the Ugandan government was there at the clinic and said it is the second best clinic in the country and they're going to bring electric into them. People would walk three and four hours to come to that clinic to be taken care of. Uh, we were given an opportunity to be able to give glasses to them at an inexpensive uh, means that when they put them on, you could see on their face light up that they could see. We couldn't help everybody, but we did an awesome, awesome job because of what you helped me with. So thank you. We appreciate you going, and we were praying for you and the group. And oh, I just said that to her. Yes. Amen. Wow. I know. It always does everyone a good good thing to go to the foreign field. Then you appreciate what you have here more. I, I see a hand up. Where was it? It couldn't have been over there, and it couldn't have been over there. It must be right there. Chet, Chet's going to speak. I just want to give God thanks. I was just sitting here thinking that March of 1970, I went to a youth rally in Atlantic City with the Salvation Army, and I gave my life to Christ down there. It'll be 53 years in March that I walked with the Lord. And you know, in all that time, he has never, ever, ever failed to meet a need. Didn't always meet the greeds that I had, but he always met the need. He provided in ways that I, I could just spend a lot of time sharing how God has just met the needs that was had. Married into a ready-made family of five boys and always needs with raising five boys. And, and uh, I remember a time mom and dad said to me, Junior, how are you going to take care of five boys, a wife and yourself, on the minimum wage, and you're already almost $3,000 in debt? How are you going to do it? And I looked at mom and dad, and I said, I really don't know, but God is in this. He knows how. And there was times that... Things were tough. We had eggs and potatoes and potatoes and eggs, many, many, many meals, more than once a day. And yet God in all that time provided. I remember a time we didn't have any bread in the house. We put in the last of what we had into the offering and came home to a whole box of bread sitting on the front porch. God has met every one of my needs. And I want to encourage you, those of you that are listening on Facebook or YouTube, I want you to know that God loves you unconditionally. He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you destitute. Turn your heart to him. Trust in him because we serve a mighty God. And I'm so thankful for what God has done in my life.
Thank you, Chip. Praise God. Well, we're getting the word now. What'd you say? Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Praise the Lord. Would you stand, please? We'll look at the title tonight. Living My Life in the Light of Eternity. I think that's a good title. It really is. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Dear Father, we thank you for this moment in time. We thank you for every testimony. We just ask, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to hear what you would want us to hear tonight. That, Lord, that we would be able to hear it, not just with our natural ears, but with our spiritual ears. So we ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Years ago when I was saved, it wasn't too long after that, I used to read a lot of tracts. That was really my first study, was studying these tracts that were given out. And there was one entitled, Living Your Life in the Light of Eternity. And it touched my life so deeply that it changed me completely, at least as much as could happen at that time, because I was a young Christian. Tonight, when we think about eternity, too often we don't know what to say about it. Normally, when we talk about eternity, we're talking about heaven. And I want you to know, I have people come to me and say, Heaven's going to be boring. I said, no, it's not. It's going to be wonderful worship. You're going to be meeting people from the Old Testament and the New Testament up there. You're going to be meeting your loved ones that have gone on before you and your friends who have gone on before you. And there's going to be so many things that will be exciting up there, how wonderful that really is. But heaven by itself is not eternity. It's part of eternity. Tonight, I want us to think about living our life in the light of eternity. That means God wants us to know something that we need to know tonight. Let me just say this. Apart from Christians, when you think about the people in the world, the majority of them pay no attention to eternity. It's not even part of their thinking at all. They're living for the here and now. Can I tell you, when you live for the here and now, that's a big waste. Can you say amen? It really is. Because if you're living for the here and now, it isn't going to matter after five more minutes. It's not going to matter at all after 50 years. And it's certainly not going to matter after eternity or throughout eternity. If you take a rope and stretch it from California to Tokyo, and that would represent all of eternity... Your life on earth would be represented by less than one millimeter. That's how what eternity is all about. I have a poem here that you probably have heard before. I cannot give credit to the author of it because I don't know who that is. But I'm sure that you've heard it or read it at some time or another. But it talks about more than heaven. It talks about giving one's life completely to Jesus here on earth because you can live it in the light of eternity. Listen to it carefully. In fact, I have it up there so you can follow along. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. That's really neat when you think about it. I have a, something that I read. It's a compelling statement. I don't know if I agree with it totally, but it's a compelling statement. It talks about a Christian atheist. I never heard of a Christian atheist, have you? It's a term that's not familiar with me at all, but it means believing in God, but living as if, as if he doesn't exist. And here is how it begins. And actually, it's a pastor who pens these particular words. Hi, I'm a Christian atheist. For as long as I can remember, I believed in God, but I haven't always lived like he exists. Hmm. You might think it's odd for a pastor to struggle with living like there is no God. 
How, however, in my corner of the world, Christian atheism is a fast-spreading spiritual pandemic which can poison, sicken, and even kill eternally. Yet Christian atheism is extremely difficult to recognize, and he tells why, especially by those who are infected. Now, James says a little bit differently than that, does he not? He doesn't use the word atheist. He talks about if we truly believe there will be corresponding actions. We truly believe we're going to be doing things directed by the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit that proves the very fact that we are a Christian. Let me ask you this question. Look up at, up at the screen. So how do you live, in, live your life in the light of eternity? Think about that for a moment. Again, Coming back to what I said in the very beginning, even Christians don't know very much about eternity. They always talk about heaven. They don't talk about all of eternity. So how do you live your life in the light of eternity? Look up at the screen and you got an answer. By thinking about accountability at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ involves time in the future. In fact, it's, you'll find that the judgment seat of Christ happens in heaven between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. I want you to think for a moment, because that's just what I've been thinking. Am I gonna, when I stand before Jesus, and he looks at me, and I was thinking about John in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where he says his eyes were like a blaze. He'll see right through us. Can you say amen? amen. Yeah. He'll know everything about us. Right. I don't know about you, but I'll probably fall to my knees instead of standing there. I'll bend over and I might be going like this because that'll be the very first time I've seen Jesus, even though I believed in him. I'm going to look into the eyes of the one who lost himself in order that I could be found and how wonderful that really, really is going to be. But anyway... When we think about this particular judgment seat of Christ, it not only involves the future, but it's going to talk about you and me giving an account to Christ. This is a plain teaching of Scripture. Look at the passage of Scripture up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear. How many can see that underline? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Note further up at the screen because we're going to draw a contrast here. The judgment seat of Christ is different from the great white throne judgment. The great, the great white throne judgment is not for Christians. It is for those who are wicked, who deny God, deny Christ, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That will take place at the end of the millennium and before the eternal state. I'm telling you right now, everyone that is before the great white throne will be unbelievers. There won't be any saved people there. Can you say amen? amen. In fact, it will be the greatest religious gathering of all time when you think about it. They don't want to be there, but they're there before God. We believers, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now let's think about this just for a moment because the judgment seat of Christ does not determine your salvation or mine. Only saved people will be before this judgment seat. No one believer will be there. And the reason we'll be there because the, the manner of our salvation was settled long ago when Jesus died for you and me. And the moment we believed, we were saved, we were set free. Can you say amen? We became a new creature, a new creation. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, all our sins are forgiven. Did you hear that? Yeah. Even when the devil comes along and tries to remind you of some of the things you did before you got saved. All our sins are forgiven. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Look up at the screen because Jesus said something that's very important here in John chapter 5, verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Amen. And when it talks about death there, it talks about what will happen to those who don't believe. It certainly it leads to the lake of fire. I don't want to be there, and I'm not going to be there. Hallelujah. We're talking about being up in heaven. In other words, the rapture's already taken place. And we will appear before Jesus Christ and stand there alone at that moment in time. That's what's going to happen. So believers are secure in Christ. You're secure tonight. So am I. We're saved. We can't be lost unless we turn our backs on the Lord. I know there's a teaching about eternal security. We are eternally secure as long as we abide or remain in Christ. He keeps us how many are glad you've been kept all along the way? That's really wonderful. But when we talk about being secure, that does not mean that we will not appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's all part of the plan that Jesus has. It'll be a time of examination and a time of reward. Jesus will inspect your work and my work. He will inspect it. He'll look at it to determine what is been done in the power of the spirit and what's been done in the energy of the flesh amen what did we do with the resources god gave us have we really done what we should have done with them too often we haven't how faithful were were we when we were on earth were we yielded to the spirit seeking to honor christ and further his work in the world like evangelism or going to Uganda, setting up a clinic and certainly in all of that, letting them know that Jesus cares, that Jesus loves, that Jesus redeems. Can you say amen? If we've done what God wants us to do in this life, there will be a reward. Did we neglect our opportunities to serve the Lord? Wow. If so, guess what? We'll suffer loss. Because, you see, he's going to look at your works and mine and figure out which of these works merits a reward. There is a reward system in what God does. Okay. The judgment seat of Christ is also not a time to punish for sin because Jesus took your punishment and took my punishment. Amen? Now, think with me clearly now. The judgment seat of Christ is a time when we'll be called on to report, to render an accounting of what we did for Jesus. Can I just share something with you right here? If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about how he had really, with the Corinthians, preached the gospel. And through Jesus Christ, they were placed on a foundation and he says be very careful how you build on that foundation you could build on it with silver well rather he says gold first gold silver and precious jewels or you could build on it with wood hay and straw and he says the fire is going to determine what has truly been done in my spirit the rest is all what we've done in the flesh. Too often we worship in the flesh. None of you, of course. I'm talking about everybody else as a Christian. Okay? But God wants us to know that we're building on the foundation, which is Christ. Paul had brought the gospel to the Corinthians. He had sent epistles to the Corinthians. He had established a foundation in Jesus, and he said to each one of them, be careful how you build upon what that foundation is. And when he talks about the fire burning the wood, the hay and the straw, he says that very plainly that that person will not be lost. They'll still be saved, but they won't probably get any reward because of their lack of faithfulness. It's like a man running out of a burning building He'll be saved, but he, he's going to lose everything there. God wants us to understand that. Now, when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, it will be a serious 
it will be a serious and necessary time of reckoning. But as God's redeemed, we will never be condemned as the wicked are. Can you say amen? Notice, if you will, up on the screen here to give us a little more understanding here. In the Greek, a single word is used for judgment seat, and it's bima. A bima was a raised platform on which judges sat to view athlete games. Their job was to make sure that every con contestant followed the rules and, to per and would, be, uh, would be able to be presented with awards if they were the victor. The bima was never placed to recommend, or rather to reprimand the athletes or to punish them in any way. The bema was really a place of reward. In the same way, the bema of Christ is not a place of condemnation or anything else like censor. Now think with me for a moment about one passage of scripture, and it's found in Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. Note it, if you will. For the lamb who was in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living foundations of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, will there really be tears in heaven, or is really this symbolic? Is it trying to draw a contrast between the tears on earth and the fact there won't be any real tears in heaven because it's a peaceful place? It's perfect love. I think there will be tears in heaven. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're not going to be condemned, but it'll be a time of instruction. And God's going to show us what could have been and what is. Are you hearing me? Yes. I think momentarily or for a little bit there will be tears. Because I don't know about you, have I always obeyed the leading of the Spirit? No. Have I been prompted to pray and I was busy driving or something and I meant to pray and I didn't pray for somebody? That's happened to me. Did I get a notion I should call somebody and then at the end of the day and it's too late to call? I said, wow, I missed that. I'm here to tell you there'll be some things that will cause us to feel like weeping. So what does that mean? We need to be diligent. We shouldn't just be saved so, oh, I'm going to heaven. Oh, great. That is great. But there's more to our Christian walk than going to heaven. We need to live the life. Can you say amen? We need to walk by the Spirit. Can you say amen? God wants us to see how important it is that we think in terms of eternity, that we recognize the fact that eternity is a long time, and we need to live our life in the light of eternity. That's what God is trying to t help us to see tonight. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, our faithful service to him will be evaluated, and it will be rewarded. And Jesus and the Father have perfect knowledge of us. Can you say amen? And with that perfect knowledge... He will assess our every thought, motive, and action. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've witnessed in the flesh. Have you ever done that? I've done a lot of things in the flesh that I didn't realize I was in the flesh. I thought I was being a person who was a great witness or a witness, and I, I came on like a bulldog instead of coming on with the compassion of Jesus. And I didn't meet them where they were. I met, I, I met them where I wanted them to be. And it didn't turn out well at all. In fact, I think in some cases I may have turned some people off. But God wants you and I to understand this prospect of coming before the judgment seat of Christ should motivate you, it should motivate me to be more like Christ in our daily life, running our spiritual race towards his heavenly rewards. How many know that there are five crowns that we will be able to have? Everybody's not going to do end up with all the five crowns because it depends, I believe, on how 
where they are spiritually, where they developed in this life. They may have one crown and then three crowns etched on that one crown because they actually fulfilled four of those crowns by what they did in their faithfulness and so on. And I do believe during the millennial reign of, the millennial reign of Christ, we're going to be at whatever level we were when we went home to be with the Lord and stood before Jesus on that day after the rapture before him at the judgment seat. And that will determine our place in the millennium as we rule and reign with Christ. Am I making that very clear? I can meditate on this stuff and it'd be very clear, but when I get up to say it, it doesn't always come out clear. But God wants you and I to be faithful. Oh God, I think he would say tonight this, if only my people would realize, yes, they've got to live in this life. They may be a mother, they may be a father, they may be a husband, they may be a wife, and they've got to really make place for all of that. But I want them to live in the light of eternity because one day they're going to look back and say, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I live my life in the light of eternity? I don't know about you, but that stirs me, just like as a young Christian when I read that track. It did something down deep inside. I said to myself, I want to really live in the light of eternity. I didn't know what that all meant. And I failed at times uh, really applying that. But it never left me. It was inside of me. And it helped me to grow in Jesus like never before and to grow like no other thing ever helped me to, to grow, to know that I've got to live my life in the light of eternity. Let me ask you this. Are you living your light in the light of eternity? Let me just tell you about a man that was a owner of a meat packing plant outside of Chicago. It was a tremendous plant. It uh, turned out beef like you couldn't believe, packaged and so on. And he said this, I'm full time for Jesus, but I'm selling beef to support me. And I knew what he meant because I think of Pastor Rich, he's got a business but he's full-time for Jesus, but he's supporting himself. We all need to be full-time. We always think, or so often we think being full-time is being like me and like Pastor Rich and others who teach and preach. Every one of us should be full-time. Every one of us should be ready to share the good news. Can you say amen? Every one of us should be open to the prompting of the Spirit. Say something to that person about me. And when we do that, then God is pleased. And on the day we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is going to commend you on that. He's going to commend me because he really likes that. He really does. So in closing tonight, Will you stand? Now remember this. I've talked about works tonight, but that can't save you. But once you are saved and you live your life in the light of eternity, there can be rewards for our faithfulness. Can you say amen? How many tonight with eyes closed can raise your hand and say, I understood what you were saying, Pastor? How, how many understand I'm not talking like Jehovah Witnesses where they say 144,000, you've got to really work if you're going to get that. I'm not talking about that at all. It's because we are in heaven, we stand before him. And he looks at our works and he evaluates them. And he says, this merits a reward that doesn't this merits a reward and that doesn't 
How many tonight could say God has challenged me to live my life in the light of eternity? Praise God. Father, I thank you for this moment in time. I know you're pleased. I know that you love us. You care about us. And you want us to live our lives in the light of eternity. I pray, Lord, for each one. I pray for myself because I'm no different than anyone else. Help me to live the rest of my life in the light of eternity. I ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.